We haven't brought this out in a while, have we, people? The reason I could do this confidently is that my dog actually ripped up the first copy of Solaris that I ever had. In some ways, a simulacra to my own Raya. But fear not! I got a second copy. Solaris is the 1961 science fiction novel by Polish author Stanisław Lem. Solaris is a 10 out of 10. You should go and read it if you haven't read it already. Now, if you've spent any time watching me review books, you know I'm not going to say this lightly. This is, like... The perfect book. So much so, and again, if you've been here for a long time, you know that this is a big deal. I'm going to read his short stories. In writing about Stanislav Lem, Theodore Sturgeon said that Stanislav Lem was one of the most widely read science fiction writers of his time. And I will say, I don't understand why more people are not talking about Lem. Because if any of his works are in somewhat of a similar vein to this, we need to start reading him now. Look, I'm aware that science fiction isn't really in my wheelhouse. I read a lot of classics and literary fiction. However, this is literary fiction done expertly. The titular Solaris is a celestial body, a planet, and our protagonist, the psychologist Dr. Chris Kelvin, has been tasked to study the planet Solaris. Covered in an oceanic gel, all of the scholarly study that has been done on the planet purports that it's not just a planet, it's a living, sentient being. That was the apt time to mention what I feel is going to be the demise and the downfall of people breaking into this book. And that is Lem's input on academic and scholarly study done on Solaris. Papers, theories, conjectures, you name it, Lem has thought about it. There is revelatory and groundbreaking work in order to understand what Solaris is. But the further the study goes, the more our notions of what Solaris is just dissipate. So for what Solaris is, is up for debate. The genius of Lem is in his absolute refusal to give any indication of what Solaris is which means there is a vivid and vast amount of interpretation that can be done on what Solaris is, what its function, what its purpose, ultimately what do you do with a concept that no one understands. Not so much that they can't understand Solaris because they have a grasp of Solaris, they just can't prove it is the thing that they think it is. So it is the proposed role of Dr. Chris Kelvin to understand Solaris. Being a psychologist, you could assume the assumptions and the connotations that is going to be brought with that role. But before he boards the space station, the scientists do something unauthorized, something experimental and aggressive. They shoot x-rays into Solaris, hoping to uncover something and develop the field of solaristics. What do they learn about the planet isn't really the question here. It now becomes, what do they learn about themselves because Kelvin now has his dead wife in front of him and so our psychologist isn't going to have a venture into space he's going to have a venture into the self to what he is as a person what has made him and the experience and the relationships that have brought him to the place where he is now with his dead wife Rhea in front of him Kelvin doesn't quite believe it but it seems as though Solaris has created this apparition of his wife, or that it's making Kelvin see his dead wife. All of the other inhabitants on this claustrophobic, paranoid space station all seem to be seeing different things. But for Kelvin, and what we're going to really follow the story of, is his relationship with Rhea. Lem, in his exquisite virtuosity of prose, allows the reader to question, is this Rhea more conscious, sentient, and therefore more human than the Rhea Kelvin has left behind? Does she have consciousness, and is she sentient? Because it appears to Kelvin that this version of Rhea in front of him is brought on by his memories of Rhea. Therefore, Rhea's existence can only come into being from what Kelvin can remember of his wife. The question surrounding what Rhea is only seems to multiply once the first Rhea is booted off the station and a second one comes into place. But in this state, if it is Rhea, she cannot die. She cannot live the life that she is 
replicating because her body is not human. She doesn't exist. Seeing these two characters interact and almost rekindle their relationship to see what has passed on turn present is ultimately bittersweet because Calvin knows how his wife died. She took her own life and that is a prominent memory of Kelvin. Solaris is a liquid giant of shoulder shrugging and confusion and asks you to probe questions. What is it to be real? What does it mean to be real? And what does real mean to us? But within closing the book, the only question that you really want to know is, are they happy together? There's nothing like Solaris and how it delves into overwrought topics such as love, memory and consciousness. This is a original and unique offering that there's nothing there's nothing I can compare it to because it is so it is unlike anything else. Solaris doesn't pass the burden of proof onto its readers but equally doesn't allow the book to become a proof of what this being is in space. Solaris to me stands at, at the pinnacle of what science fiction should be. With the being of Solaris being this oceanic gel, there's no real way to mirror any human element in it, neither is there a way to anthropomorphize it. I'm looking at you, Arthur C. Clarke. Rendezvous around was a painstaking joke. The information that Lem provides you is there to inform your interpretation. It's not there to, it's not there providing you a groundwork of interpretation. It just allows you to just experience the book and to come out with some conclusion, Leb allows his reader to meander and languish through the rhizomic passageway of interpretation, which means just for a richer, more fulfilling work on something that I cannot tell you what it is. Deering, sublime, spectacular, damn perfect. This is incredible.